So far with principal component analysis, we've dealt entirely in a linear world. And uh, now it's time to try and take that first step into uh, situations where we have really nonlinear manifolds in our feature spaces. So we've, we've seen, as we were playing with linear regression and in particular with support vector machines, that we can add uh, a set of nonlinear transformations to the input features and then use all of our linear tools in this new expanded feature space. So here we're projecting from some small uh, feature space, expanding it out to a much larger feature space, and then doing principal component analysis in, in this uh, large space. As with support vector machines, with kernel PCA, it turns out that the kernel trick also works. And what that means is that even in our expanded space, we have many features, we can actually compute our principal components in a very efficient way. However, what this means is that our training process and our query process are both sensitive to the number of samples that we have in our training set. Okay, so let's look at the code. I'm working here in the same notebook uh, that we were just a moment ago with the principal component analysis. So everything is already loaded up as far as the baby kinematics goes. So, so first let's go ahead and create our kernel PCA model. I'm going to define a variable here, uh, which tells us how many degrees of freedom that we have to work with. And here we get to define what kernel we want to use. So if you look at the documentation, you can see you can certainly have a linear kernel if you want, uh, which takes us back to uh, just standard PCA, uh, or we can have an RBF kernel or a polynomial kernel, and there are a few other options. I'm gonna go ahead and select an RBF kernel. And there is a gamma parameter which specifies the, the width of our Gaussian kernels. And since we're going to be using the inverse transform, we actually have to tell kernel PCA to actually, to actually compute the, that part of the transform. So fit inverse transform Okay, so that flag will, will, will tell kernel PCA to do that extra computation. My keyboard apparently is acting up here. So I'm going to fit the, the training set. And I could actually do a fit transform, which, which would combine these two operations. I'm just making them ver explicit here, that they're different steps. Okay. so. I just started that executing. It's going to uh, take, I don't know, about 10 or 20 seconds or so uh, executing on my uh, laptop. I think we've talked before about uh, using the top, the top program. If you go to Jupyter and open up a, a terminal shell, uh, you can execute top right in there. Uh, in this case, you can see here's my the very top thing. That's, that's the thing that's using the most CPU. Python 3 here, it is using about 600% of a single CPU. So it's, it's parallelizing the computations that it's doing. I have a total of eight different cores on this machine. So this could 
technically go all the way up to 800% if, uh, if it wasn't needing so much uh, memory as well. All right, that took about 45 seconds or so to finish execution. Uh, I've already brought in the code to do the uh, plotting of the 20 uh, different uh, compressed features. So let's look at that. And there's not a whole lot to glean from uh, staring at uh, this since there are 20 uh, different curves. Uh, but what is interesting is that we are seeing curves that, that are operating on different frequencies. There are, there are some curves like this blue curve here that really aren't showing a whole lot of variation except in this vicinity here. You can see that green curve dips down in one small area. And then things like this red curve have seem to have much more higher frequency kinds of components to them. So, so the different the different compressed features are capturing different aspects of the movements. All right, let's look at reconstruction. We're still we're going to still show channel twelve for comparison's sake. And in training, this is our ground truth, and our reconstruction is um, is now called reconstruct KPCA. So I need to change that out here. Okay, so there, there we go. So, so with those twenty PCA features in in this uh, kernel space, uh, we're actually reconstructing. We're actually reconstructing the uh, the blue curve quite well. We're capturing a lot of uh, features. The, the other thing, though, that really stands out is that uh, the red curve has a lot of high frequency noise inside of it. So there's probably a certain degree of overfitting that we're uh, doing uh, with this particular model. And so playing with parameters like uh, the gamma parameter can uh, possibly help with this. Okay, I, I also wanted to show you the what the original curve looked like when we were just doing principal component analysis. So so what I did there was a, it was a right click, I, I split the cell into two different pieces. So this cell I'm still going to uh, show you what it looks like for a for our a kernel PCA. I also wanted to show you what it looked like for uh, reconstruction with our original principal component analysis. And in this case, um, with this is with 20 features. Uh, there is some high frequency noise there, but one thing that's striking is that the red is not tracking the blue curve quite as well. So let me roll this back so you can see what the kernel PCA is uh, doing there. So I, I would say here, K, kernel PCA is doing a, a bit better, um, but both of these models, I do worry about this high frequency noise. All right, let's look at our validation set now. And so I already have the code here for transforming our uh, validation set using our new K PCA model. And let's rename this uh, XVAL PCA, and then we're going to reconstruct that. Sorry, this is going to be KPCA. And then down here, it's reconstruct val KPCA. All right, so let's go ahead and execute those. That took a couple seconds to, to do the compression and, and then reconstruction. And there is our result. And, and again, this is again with 20 principal components. So we didn't expect the reconstruction to be uh, perfect. Let's look at the reconstruction for the PCA model so that we can compare that against KPCA. So I already have the code uh, sitting down here for that. And there is our reconstruction. I don't have this scaled quite right to fit on the screen entirely. But what you can go back one more. Uh, so there, there, I guess there are two striking things. One is that at least there are parts where our kernel PCA actually is doing a little bit better as far as reconstruction. So the error in this region here is, is better than this region down here. Although this area here, the error is a little bit, is either equivalent or a little bit bigger. Errors in the opposite direction for, for this particular case. 
Um, the other striking thing here is that the, uh, we have the higher frequency noise uh, in here. And, and again, that's coming from the fact that we're probably uh, overfitting our models uh, to a higher degree here. So playing with some regularization, playing with that gamma parameter will actually help with that. So I encourage you to, to uh, give those uh, a try, play some more with, with parameters uh, while you have this particular notebook open. All right, this ends our conversation about principal component analysis and the kernel form of it. Next up, we're going to start looking at uh, some embedding approaches to solving this manifold problem.